Mr. Buffett, how can I make $30 billion? Start young. <laughs> Charlie's always said that the, the big thing about it is we started building this little snowball on top of a very long hill. So we started at a very early age in rolling the snowball down. And of course, the snowball, the nature of compound interest is it behaves like a snowball of sticky snow. And the trick is to have a very long hill, which means either starting very young or living to be very old. And you know, I would do it exactly the same way if I were doing it in the investment world. I mean, if I were getting out of school today and I had $10,000 to invest, I'd, I'd start with the A's. I would start going right through companies and I, I probably would focus on smaller companies because I would be working with smaller sums and there's more chance that something is overlooked in that arena. And as Charlie has said earlier, it won't be like doing that in 1951 when you could leaf through and find all kinds of things that, that just leapt off the page at you. But that's the only way to do it. I mean, you have to buy businesses or little pieces of businesses called stocks and you have to buy them at attractive prices and, and you have to buy into good businesses. and. That advice will be the same 100 years from now in terms of investing. That's that's what it's all about. If I were working with a small amount of money, the universe would be huge compared to the universe of possible ideas I work with now. You mentioned that 56 to 69 was the best period. Actually, my best period was before that. It was from right after I met Ben Graham in 19, early 1951. But from the end of 1950 through the next 10 years, actually returns averaged about 50% a year. And they, I think they were 37 points better than the Dow per year, something like that. But that I was working with a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of money. And so I would pour through volumes of businesses and I would find one or two that I could put $10,000 into or $15,000 into that were just ridiculous. They were ridiculously cheap. And obviously, as the money increased, the universe of possible ideas started shrinking dramatically. The times were also better for doing it in that time. But I think that I think if you're working with a small amount of money with exactly the same background that Charlie and I have and same ideas, same whatever ability we have, you know, I think you can make very significant sums. But you but as soon as you start getting the money up in, into the millions, many millions, the curve on expectable results falls off just dramatically. But that's that's the nature of it. it when you get up to things you can put millions of dollars into, You've got a lot of competition looking at that, and they're not looking as I did when I started. When I started, I went through the pages of the manuals, page by page. I probably went through 20,000 pages uh, in the Moody's Industrial Transportation Banks and Finance manuals, and I did it twice. And I actually you know, looked at every business. I didn't look very hard at some. Well, that's not a practical way to invest tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so I would say if you're working with a small sum of money, and you're really interested in the business and willing to do the work, you can, you will find something if you were, I, you, you, there's no question about it in my mind, you will find some things that promise very large returns compared to what we will be able to uh, uh, deliver uh, with large sums of money. Is business school worth it? Depends on the person. That, uh, much more than it depends on the school. Some people are going to get a lot out of advanced education and some people are going to get very little. And uh, I don't even think it's important that every person go to college at all. We have all kinds of jobs at 70 or so thousand a year, 80,000 a year that college training is not of use. And I actually was not keen on going to college myself. Yeah, my dad kind of jollied me into it. He could get me to do anything, but I knew I could have a good time. I liked investing and I could read the books. You know, it's a big commitment to take four years and the cost involved and maybe the loans involved and everything. I think depending on what your interests are in life, I don't think it's for everybody. I think it's for a lot of people, but there ought to be a reason you're going. And I didn't really see much reason. There's nothing like following your passion. I mean, I love what I do, obviously, and I've loved it the whole time I've done it. Charlie is the same way. We have managers, you know, they come, some of them went to business school, some of them didn't, you know, they, they, they're all types, but the common factor, they're successful, the common factor is they love what they do, you know, and you've got to find that in life. And some people are very lucky in finding it very early. I was, you know, I, it was dumb luck that my father happened to be in the securities business. So when I would go to his office, there were a lot of books to read and I got entranced with that. But. You know, if he'd been in some other occupation, I think I would have read those books eventually, but it would have been a lot later. So if you find something that turns you on, 
my guess is you're going to do very well. And then the beauty of it is, in a sense, there's not that much competition. I mean, it, it, uh, there are not a lot of people out there that are going to be running faster than you in the race that you elect uh, to get into. And uh, if you haven't found it yet, you may well have found it. But if you haven't found it yet, you know, you've got to keep looking. And we've got 70 plus managers. You know, some of them, some of them didn't. We, we had one guy that didn't go to high school, even didn't they? Charlie and Rosner. The, oh, yeah. You know, he, he quit in fourth grade, I think. Uh, yeah. But, uh, well, Mrs. B never went to school a day in her life, you know. And when you go out to the furniture mart, I hope you go out this evening. We expect to set a record today in sales. What you are looking at on those 78 acres. You know, it's the largest home furnishing store, about 400 million of sales, largest store in the United States. And it comes from $500 of capital paid in by a woman that never went to school a day in her life and couldn't read or write. You know, I mean, it, she loved what she was doing. And, you know, I tell the story. This is a true story. Uh, when she was in well into her 90s, she invited me over to her house for dinner. That was very unusual. Had a very nice house, six or seven blocks away from the store. And I went into the house and the sofa, the chairs, the lamp, the dining room table, they all had little green price tags hanging down. At the, it made her feel at home. And, and I said to her, Mrs. B, you are my kind of woman, yeah? Forget Sophia Loren, all the rest. I mean, this is my kind of woman. <laughs> she loved it, you know, and she loved it all her life. And just think of what that produced. I mean, it just, it's incredible. I mean, the, you know, one time my dad used to quote Emerson that the power that lies within you is new in nature, you know, and basically the power that was within Mrs. B was new in nature. And, and over a lifetime, it, it produced amazing things. So find, find your passion and then don't let anything stop you. The biggest mistakes are the ones that actually don't show up. They're the mistakes of omission rather than commission. We've never lost that much money on any one investment, uh, but it's the things that I knew enough to do that I didn't do. We have missed profits of as much as, you know, maybe $10 billion in things that I knew enough to do and I didn't do. Now, the fact I didn't buy Microsoft way back uh, is not a foregone opportunity because I didn't know enough to make that decision. But there have been other investments where I didn't know enough to make the decision. And for one reason or another, I either didn't do it at all or I did it on a small scale. I was sucking my thumb when I should have been writing checks, you know, basically. And, <laughs> and, and you know, those don't show up. You know, there's no place where it, it shows missed opportunities, but I've, I've missed some big ones. I will take a person graduating from college and assuming they're in normal shape and everything, I will be glad to pay them, you know, probably $50,000 for 10% of all their earnings for the rest of their lives. Well, if I'm willing to pay them 10% for well, 50,000 for 10%, that means they're worth 500,000 if they haven't got a dime in their pocket, as long as they've got a good mind and a good body. Well, if you're interested in business, I definitely think you ought to learn all the accounting you can by the time you're in your early 20s. Accounting is the language of business. Now, that doesn't mean it's a perfect language. So you have to know the limitations of that language, as well as well, all aspects of it. So I would advise you to learn accounting and I would advise you to be in terms of part-time employment or anything else, work in a number of businesses. There's nothing like seeing how business operates to uh, build your judgment in the future about businesses. When you understand what kind of things are very competitive and what kind of things are less competitive and why that works that way, all of that adds to your knowledge. So I would do a lot of reading if you're interested in investments, I would, A, I would take the accounting courses. I do a lot of reading about investments and uh, I would get as much business experience. I would talk business with people that are in business to, to find out what they think uh, makes their operation tick or where they have problems and why. I just think you just kind of sop it up every place that uh, you can. 70 years ago, I was in high school. Almost a third as long as the country has been around. And when I was in high school, I really only had two things on my mind, girls and cars. <laughs> and, and I wasn't doing very well with girls, so we'll talk about cars. <laughs> but let's just imagine that when we finish, I'm gonna let 
each one of you pick out the car of your choice. Sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, pick it out, any color, you name it, it'll be tied up with a bow and it'll be at your house tomorrow. And you say, well, what's the catch? <laughs> and the catch is that it's the only car you're going to get in your lifetime. Now, what are you going to do knowing that that's the only car you're ever going to have and you love that car? <laughs> you're going to take care of it like you cannot believe. Now, what I'd like to suggest, you're not going to get only one car in your lifetime, but you're going to get one body and one mind, and that's all you're going to get. And that body and mind feels terrific now, but it has to last you a lifetime. The key is to certainly, in terms of your personal life, the most important decision you'll make is the spouse that most of you will likely have. And it's very important to surround yourself with people that are the better than you are. You are going to move in the direction of the people you associate with. So I, I've been enormously lucky in that respect. I mean, I've, uh, I've just had teachers and friends and a spouse that really was a better person than I was. And I had enough sense to learn from these people that, that life went better if you behave better yourself. And, uh, uh, it took a while. <laughs> the, uh, uh, so I, I advise you to seek out as your partner in business, your partner in life, whatever it may be, look for the people that actually uh, are examples to you rather than somebody that you think you need to straighten out yourself. And simple rules like that, delighting customers, working through other people, associating with people that will, will cause you to move in a better path than you might otherwise have, they will take you so far in life that uh, it, it, it's hard to believe.